Hi, and thank you for tuning in to Gavin Lon Digital. I'm Gavin Lon. In the last part of this course, i.e. part nine of this course, we implemented the relationship between the category entity and the category item entity on the front end, as it were. We coded the application so that when an administrator clicks a link labeled Update Items, which is presented to the administrator next to each category on the Category Entities Index view, the user is navigated to the Category Item Index view, where the category items that are related to the relevant category are displayed in the Category Item Index view to the administrator. In the previous part of this course, we also coded the application so that an administrator can create new category items from the Category Item Index view for the relevant category. So we are now able to create multiple category items for a particular category through our web application. In the last video in this course, we were able to create a number of category items related to the c -sharp for Beginners category. For example, introduction to c -sharp, c -sharp data types, c -sharp variables, etc. In this tutorial, i.e. the 10th part of this course, we are going to complete the CRUD-related functionality for the category item entity. If you'd like to help support the channel by making a donation, or simply thank me by buying me a cup of coffee, a PayPal link has been included below in the description. You can of course support the channel by giving the videos a thumbs up and subscribing, and please ring the bell to be notified of future content. As discussed, we have already completed the code that implements the create operation for the category item entity. In this video, we'll implement the code for the read, update, and delete functionality. So, in terms of CRUD, we have already implemented the code relevant to C, which represents the create operation in the CRUD acronym. In this video, we'll complete the code for the other CRUD-related operations, namely R representing the read functionality, U representing the update functionality, and D representing the delete functionality. So let's get started. So let's first focus our attention on the update functionality. In the previous part of this course, we briefly discussed REST, representational state transfer, and the two REST verbs that are related to our create action methods. So we discussed the fact that the category item controller has two create methods. One of these create methods is decorated with an attribute named HTTP POST. This attribute tells the MVC framework, as it were, that this create method contains code that implements the functionality relevant to the HTTP POST request. The other create method in the category item controller class does not contain a REST-related attribute pertaining to a REST verb. By default, the MVC framework knows, as it were, that this action method pertains to a HTTP GET request. A HTTP GET attribute does exist, so if we needed to explicitly mark a particular method as a method related to a HTTP GET request, we can do it using the HTTP GET attribute. We can do it by declaring the HTTP attribute against the relevant action method. But if a HTTP related attribute, for example, HTTP POST, is not declared against an action method, the MVC framework will deem the relevant action method as related to a HTTP GET request. So the functionality we are about to implement relates to a HTTP GET request. When the administrator clicks a link labeled Edit, which appears next to each category item in a list of category items displayed to the administrator on the index raise view pertaining to the category item entity, the Edit Action method in the category item controller class is invoked on the server side. So this is the action method where we need to implement the code for retrieving the data relevant to a particular category item from the database and pass the category item data back to the relevant edit view, which will then be displayed to the administrator. The administrator can then modify the data if necessary, i.e. update the data and submit the modified data back to the server. The edit action method that has the HTTP POST attribute declared against it will then be invoked. So this is where the code to save modified data back to the database resides. It resides in the edit action method, which is decorated with the HTTP POST attribute. If we look at the index view for the category item entity, we can see that a root related attribute is present, i.e. 
an attribute named ASP-root-ID. This attribute is set to the relevant category item's ID value, which is the primary key value for the relevant category item. So when this link is clicked, the relevant category item's primary key is passed to the relevant edit action method. So this action method will be called, i.e. the action method that does not contain a HTTP POST attribute declared against it, which means this action method performs functionality related to a HTTP GET request. So the code to find the relevant category item entity data has already been generated for us. This was done when we performed the relevant scaffolding operation, which we did in the last part of this course. As you can see here in this line of code, where the view method is being called, at the end of the method, the category item object is passed to the relevant edit razor view. The category item object contains data retrieved from the database, which is done at this line of code here through this link query. The primary key value for the relevant category item entity is passed into the find async extension method, which is used to retrieve the relevant category item data from our database. So we already have default functionality present in this edit method to retrieve the relevant category item data and populate the relevant edit razor view with the relevant category item data. We don't, however, at this point, have the code necessary for retrieving the data we need to populate a drop-down list that contains the media type items. If you'll recall, this is something that we did for the create functionality in the last part of this course. So in the create view, the user can choose the media type item from a drop-down list containing a list of media type items before adding a category item to the system. We also want an administrator to have the ability to select a different media type item if deemed necessary while modifying data for a particular category item. So we need to write code within the relevant edit action method to retrieve a list of media type items that can be used to populate a drop-down list containing the relevant list of media type items. So let's do that. Let's create a link query to retrieve all the media type items currently saved to the system. Please see the previous tutorial for details on how we populated the media type database table using Transact SQL through the SQL Server Management Studio. If you have not populated the media type database table with relevant data, please see a link below in the description to a SQL script that can be run with an SSMS, SQL Server Management Studio, to add appropriate media type data to the media type database table. So let's define a variable as a generic list that is strongly typed as media type. Let's then assign it the value returned from the appropriate link query. This link query is quite simple. Let's use the media type property exposed on the context object and call the toList async conversion method on the data returned from the media type property. This line of code will retrieve all media type items currently saved to the system and populate our media type variable with the results of the relevant link query. We can then assign the object stored in our media types variable to the media types property exposed on the relevant category item object. However, we do need to go one step further. A dropdown list implemented by the RazorView technology stores a list that is of type select list item. So remember, in the previous part of this course, we wrote an extension method that converts a list of objects that implement the I primary properties interface to a list of objects of the select list item type. Remember that we made our media type class implement the I primary properties interface. We did this so that we can easily convert objects of type media type to objects of type select list item so that we can easily populate our drop-down list. So we want the media type item that is currently saved against a relevant category item to be displayed to the administrator when the edit razor view page is loaded. So to do this, we can pass the relevant media type ID to the convert to select list extension method like this. So let's implement the code for the edit razor view. So the code for the category ID property of the category item entity has by default been generated for us. This was done when we scaffolded the code for the CRUD operations pertaining 
to the category item entity. This is code pertaining to a foreign key field from the category entity and we don't want a user to be able to see this value or be able to manipulate this value. We can retain the category ID value on the front end without exposing it to the user by storing the category ID value in a hidden field. So let's do this. So let's copy this code here and paste it to the top of the relevant HTML form here. Let's then change the relevant element from a select element to a hidden input field like this. Great. Let's now create the code for our media type dropdown list. So we can easily do this by setting the ASP-Items attribute within the relevant select element to the media types property of our model like this. Great. So the code for an administrator to be able to edit data for a particular category item is pretty much in place. Let's test the code. So we added a few category items to the system in the previous part of this course. So let's edit this particular item here. Let's change the text for the description field. Let's change the word learn to learner so that this description makes a bit more sense. Let's save our changes. As you can see, we are navigated back to the index view for the category item entity, but we are not presented with a list of category items. This is unexpected. So the reason for this is that we need to explicitly include the relevant category ID root parameter in the code here that navigates the user back to the index view after the relevant update functionality within the post edit action method has successfully completed. So we can fix this issue by passing in an object containing a value for the category ID that is related to the relevant category item. So let's fix the issue by passing in an anonymous object to the redirect to action method. This means that when the code redirects the user to the index view of the category item entity, that a list of category items related to the relevant category will be presented to the user. So in terms of the code, by including this anonymous object containing the relevant category ID value, we are letting the MVC framework know, as it were, that the category item is related to the category relevant to the category ID value being passed into this method here. Let's test the code again. Excellent. So our update functionality is now in place. Let's ensure that our read and delete functionality is working as expected. The read functionality encapsulated within the details action method doesn't need to be modified. There's only one method for the details action method which pertains to a HTTP GET request. So we don't need to modify the code regarding the details action method. That was auto-generated for us through the scaffolding operation we performed in the previous part of this course. The delete functionality contains both functionality pertaining to a HTTP GET request 
and a HTTP POST request. Like with the Edit POST request functionality and the Create POST request functionality, we need to ensure that once the delete operation implemented in the delete POST action method has been completed successfully, that the appropriate category ID value is passed to the relevant category item entity's index action method. This must be done so that the link query within the relevant index action method knows, as it were, which category items should be returned for the relevant category. So within the post action method for the delete functionality, let's pass in an argument to the redirect to action method that contains an anonymous object with a category ID property set to the appropriate category ID value. Let's test the delete functionality. Excellent. So we have now completed the functionality for our CRUD operations pertaining to both the category entity and the category item entity. We'll focus on the content entity in the next tutorial. So we are now able to create, read, update and delete data for both the category entity and the category item entity through our web application. Excellent! If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. It will be greatly appreciated. Please consider subscribing for content like this and much more. And please ring the bell to be notified of future content. Please feel free to share this video with anyone you feel may benefit from its content. If you'd like to help support the channel by making a donation or simply thank me by buying me a coffee, a PayPal link has been included below in the description. I really enjoy engaging with you in the comments section, so please feel free to share your thoughts with me in the comments section. If you have any questions regarding aspects of the course so far, please leave them below in the comments section and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. The latest code can be found on GitHub. A link to the relevant repository has been included below in the description. Thank you and take care.